ان شاء الله جزاك الله خير تو اور شيخ استاذ مصطفى ابو ريان ما الله ريوارد من بلس هيم فور ذا بريف يا ديبلي ديتيل كلمه جزاه الله خيرا سبحان الله every time I come and sit here it seems that the brothers are spreading further and further so if I can ask the brothers inshallah to move as close as possible now before we start our last kalima the last talk uh, and it's by our ustad al-sheikh Abu Usama hafizahullah as you know the sheikh originally comes from the US he's someone that is known in the da'wah scene and someone that is uh, I, I regard as one of the best speakers may Allah bless him and reward him and he's someone that has served as an imam, as a khatib in numerous masajid. Alhamdulillah, yesterday I mentioned that the Shaykh just come back from Umrah fresh. So even though he's tired, even though he's been traveling, Alhamdulillah, he's blessed us with his presence. So without further ado, he's going to be discussing just a general piece of advice for the youth, inshallah. Jazakumullah khairan. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله حمدا كثيرا وطيبا مباركا فيه وصلوات الله والسلام على نبينا الأمين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين أما بعض don't have a lot of time the brothers have decided in weighing the situation that they'll make the talk short 20-25 minutes and this way, inshallah, you can uh, get through the talk, get out of the talk, and you guys not be overwhelmed. That's a good thing, it has benefit in that. But the flip side of that is, if you sit a long time, it's easy to become tired and bored, especially with the, you know, the ability to focus and concentrate with many people, it's not, that is easy. I think the one group of people that I was most impressed with in my travels in terms of being able to sit down for long periods of time were the people from Indonesia. When I went to Indonesia with a Sheikh Al-Akh, Muhammad Ali, he was responsible for actually getting them to consider me and we went to Indonesia and we went to the big mystery there from many of the places that we visited and there was the mystery called al Istiqlal like 150,000 people praying that masjid. And I remember our Sheikh Ali Al-Halabi, Rahmatullahi Alayhi, he was giving some lectures and I was blown away at how those students sat so close to one another and they sat without moving. Being a revert to the religion, I wasn't born, I didn't grow up sitting on the floor. So when I became a Muslim, I found it difficult, difficult to do a lot of the things that we take for granted, like sit on the floor, like, excuse me, even going to the hammam. Uh, my, my legs are not fit like that. So I used to just be blown away from that. So you guys be patient, inshallah. I just have a few words I want to share with you. Coming back from Mecca recently and coming back from performing Umrah with a group of people, about 100 people, when you go and you're the religious leader for people for Umrah, the atmosphere, the environment is the perfect environment for Dawud Allah. Because the people were there, they're there for the first time, many of them. So as the teacher, as the Dai, all I have to do is have some hikmah and call to what will inspire and inform. We have a problem right now where a lot of the people are giving Dawud Allah are tone deaf. We have a lot of challenges facing our community, the haddiyat, you know, challenges for youngsters. LGBT, it's a big challenge. The domestic policy, the foreign policy of this country causes and forces a lot of our shabab to become extreme because they see the way these governments are dealing with Muslims across the globe and people wanna go and do crazy things. The fitna of boys and girls getting high there are a lot of issues that are on the table. We can spend the rest of my time just talking about, just naming the tahadiyat. When I was young, when I was young, it was a job and the responsibility of African American people who are not Muslims, our elders, to just teach us to love ourselves because the system, Christianity, the way America is, it teaches African Americans to hate themselves. So we would take time out uh, they would take time out for us 
to teach young brothers like this to love yourself. You go to buy a doll baby for your girl, for your baby girl, and you know, most people bought white doll babies. You ask the black child, why did you buy the doll baby? Why do you want the white one? You say, because it's pretty. Why you don't want the black one? Because it's ugly. We hated ourselves. That was part of the big challenge. That's part of the challenge today, but that challenge pales in com comparison to what the youngsters have to deal with today. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned the authentic hadith, and we should consider this, especially older people. He said, ma min amin illa wal-ladhi ba'du sharru minhu hatta talqaw rabbukum. There's no year that comes except that the year that's after it is worse than the year that went before it. Isma'u, isma'u. There was no year since Allah created Adam. The next year was worse than the year prior to that. And worse and worse and worse and worse and worse and worse until you meet your Lord. And the Prophet said about this ummah he came to, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that yomul qiyamah won't be established until people won't say Allah, Allah. He described the Muslims, and he said that the Muslims, al-Islam, is going to fade away the way your thobe fades away. You buy a brand spanking new thobe, it has nice color, nice embroidery when you first buy it. And you rock that thobe to the first Juma, second Juma, to the Eid, you wear it sparingly, you go to the Nikah, the Walima with it. But every time you wash that thobe, the print, it fades away. The embroidery on the thobe, it gets more messed up. Until finally, it's like the thobe you have on right now. It's not as white it was as it was when you bought it. It's not as blue, it's not as black. The jilbab is tattered now. He said, Al Islam is going to do that, it's going to fade away until the Muslims won't know what is salat. They won't know what is zakat. They won't know what is hajj. And I know for a fact, and I don't know most of you, and I'm not speaking condescendingly about or to anyone here, but I know for a fact, if someone came with an airline ticket to go to Mecca and Medina and say, Ya Abdullah, here, here's your airline ticket, go make umrah, go and make hajj. Most of us won't know what we're doing. Hajj is a pillar of Al-Islam. We won't have the begin the foggiest idea how and what to do. When we were performing Umrah just now, people who were in our group were asking questions, and I don't think any question is a dumb question, although there is fiqh in asking questions. You can't just ask any question, what came first, the chicken and the egg. Get out of here with that chicken or the egg, man. You just better know Allah created the chicken and the egg. What are you talking about? We don't ask those kind of questions. If we go to Jannah, will we go in with our right foot or the left? Get out of here with that stuff. Ar-Rahman wa ala al-Arsh istawa. How did Allah go? Man, get out of here with that stuff. Those kind of questions. There's fiqh in asking questions. How to ask questions. The good question is half of knowledge. Anyway, the point that I want to make is the person asks the question, we're gonna make Umrah. So we have to travel from Mecca, from Medina to Mecca, and they ask, you know, in my ihram, when I put my ihram on, can I go to the toilet? And can I make salat? Make wudu and go to salat, make salat. I'm not putting down that question, making istihan of the question, I'm not doing that, but come on, man. You're gonna be in ihram for maybe eight, nine, 10, maybe 15, 16 hours. You asking, can you go to the hammam? Akramakumullah. But it's to that degree that our community, so me, as a da'i of Allah, the names and the attributes of Allah. Allah has two right hands that befit his majesty. Allah Ta'ala comes down in a way that befits his majesty at the last third of every night. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has characteristics. If you come to Allah walking, Allah come to you running. What does that mean? So when I go into a masjid that I don't know them, they don't know me, it makes no sense for me to go in that masjid and start talking about that stuff. It's the haq, it's the truth. But as Abdullah ibn Umar said, or Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, as well as Ali ibn Abi Talib, ma anta bi muhaddith qawmin hadithan lam yabluq uquluhum, Fitna. 
And the other one said, حَدِّثُ nas عَلَى قَدْرْ عُقُولِهِمْ أَتُرِيدُهُ مَنْ يُكَذِّبُ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولُهُ Listen to this. Ali said, you never talk to a group of people about an issue that they don't understand except that you'll be a fitna for them. So be careful what you're talking about. Abdullah bin Mas'ud said, talk to the people in accordance to their level of understanding. Do you want them to reject Allah and his messenger? So some of these young brothers from the Diobandi Maslak, these hardcore Ahnaf, and Wallahi, I love Al-Imam Abu Hanifa, and I love the ulama of the Ahnaf. What I don't like is a taqlid al-a'ma and a ta'assub from these jama'at, the hardcore Salafi people, Ikhwani people, Sufi people. All of this stuff is not what Allah sent in his religion. As shahid, if I'm talking, I have to know what I'm talking about. Those people were with me at Umrah. What do I look like talking to these people about these higher aspects of knowledge? Now, there's someone in this audience who understands exactly what I'm saying and the point. Levi, yani astahdifu. He understands. But then there's someone in the audience who say, he's mumayya. He's mutasahil. Because he's the one who wants to get up and say crazy things like we used to have to deal with here in the UK 15, 20 years ago. In this masjid, in this masjid, I was a really good student in this masjid, I remember. I don't want to get too specific, I don't want no fitna, but we don't want our children going over to Syria, getting married without the father knowing about it. We don't want that nonsense. It wouldn't help anything. But back then there was a guy, I won't mention his name, the leader of the HT people, and I'm making a point here. He was asked, if you Muslims were, get, were to be given the Khilafah in this country, if you were given the Khilafah, we all want the Khilafah. But we want it not as an empty slogan where we're sitting, we're screaming, Khilafah, khi no. We want the real Khilafah. How was that established? By everybody establishing the Khilafah in their house. You have to establish the Khilafah with your PlayStation. You have to establish the Khilafah when you're by yourself and not masturbating. You have to establish the Khilafah by not watching pornography. Everybody here, if you establish the Khilafah in your house, Allah establishing in the earth for us. But Umar ibn al-Khattab, Umar ibn al-Khattab, look at the hukam. Well, if Umar ibn al-Khattab was here right now, he'll be hitting a lot of people over their heads with a stick right now. Because he used to hit people who didn't come to Fajr for the Salat al-Fajr in the masjid, if he didn't see you. So we get the rulers who resemble us and we resemble them. Point is, they ask that guy, if you guys got the Khilafah, what would you do? BBC. I watched with my own eyes. BBC. He said, first thing we're going to do is we're going to chop the heads off every woman who doesn't wear hijab. When I heard that answer, I said, this is madness. Sheer janoon. This is not the advice that our shabab and our ummah needs at this time. This craziness. One of our young sisters, as you know, she's over there stuck, had three babies in a marriage, from a marriage in Syria. Her parents had nothing to do with that. Each one of those babies died. Now she wants to come back to the UK, but she can't. She took off her hijab. I'm an advocate to let her back. She was a baby when she did what she did. She didn't know what she was doing. She was a baby, 16, 17, 18. You're a baby. But look at the aqliya. People were calling to that. So we need people who are uqala, hukama. People who know what they're doing. Not people who are being judged and ruled and pushed by their emotions. So my advice to you, Shabab, is take it easy. Slow down and pump your brakes. Slow down and pump your brakes. I always felt, because of my background in Jahiliya, where I came from, that I know what time it is. I'll always know what time it is as it relates to the streets and people and games. I have my kids. I tell my kids, I know what time it is. Some of you are wondering, yeah, he got a watch on his hand. You know what time? I'm not talking about this watch. I'm not talking about the time here. I'm talking about I know the deal. I tell my kids all the time, don't lie to me. But it is a fact. This is a new generation. I don't know a lot. I put my hand up to that. 
I'm Jahil. And I'm not like the Somali father, the Pakistani Asian father, the Arab mother and father who don't know what time. I know what weed smells like. If my kid came in, I know he was smoking a joint. I know that. Some of our parents think it's incense, bakhor. <laughs> parents say, it's nice bakhor, where you get that from? And he's looking at his mom with glass eyes. Yeah, I know, mom. No, there are a lot of things I don't know about IT and all of this. I have to be on top of my kids to make sure they're not watching with it because they know all the tricks. I don't. So what I want to share with you, brothers, very quickly is just two stories. But in these two stories, I don't want to be like the storytellers. I don't want to be like the storytellers. The salaf of this ummah used to warn you of listening to storytellers. And my journey in Islam, I met up with Jamaat al-Tabliq because I was looking for the truth. But they were just telling me stories. They had some nice brothers there. But I found out very quickly this is not the way. I'm not bashing them and punching down on them. I'm just telling the truth. That's not what I want. And I'm not here to tell stories. And I advise you, don't learn from the dude who's the storyteller. Don't do that. Anybody could tell a story. Now, storytelling has its place in the religion. That's why we have the surah called Al-Qasus, the stories. Allah tells us stories throughout the Quran. Yusuf is a beautiful story. Benefit in that. But the man was in the masjid, and he was telling stories, 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 during the time of Ali bin Abi Talib, and he was the khalifa. May Allah be pleased with him. The people went and said, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, there's this cat over there telling stories. He asked him, does he know the nasikh and the mansukh, what abrogated and what was abrogated in the Quran? Does he know that science? Just that science. They said, no. He said, then he is destroyed, and he's going to destroy the people. Stop him from telling these stories. Stories is not our religion. You get no fiqh in that. But I'm going to tell you some stories of what happened in Hajj, in Umrah recently. Just two, that's all, very quickly. First one is, in Mecca, we arrived in Mecca, and I wasn't sleeping well because I was having insomnia, and I was tired from the group. The first Friday, I don't go to the Juma. I stay in my room, and I listen to the khutbah so I can translate it properly, and then I translate it, and they film me, and we send it to our group because they don't know Arabic. So the hadith said, Man taraka shay'in lillah, awwaduhu ma'ahu wa khayru minhu. Anyone who leaves something for Allah's sake, Allah will give you that which is better. Juma, on Friday, in Mecca, 100,000 rewards is a lot. But I'm going to leave it to translate for the people, perhaps perchance they'll benefit. Now, the young person in the audience say, how can you go way over there, Mr. Juma? That's how his fiqh is. But as you get older and older, you learn how to fall back a little bit and observe in a different way. He wants to marry somebody, and he's from, for an example, one ethnic background, and the girl is from another ethnic background. He's an Arab and she's African, and they're both practicing. But the mother and the father and the family are racist. They're not ready for that. And the mother and the father here are racist. They're not ready for that. The young man, he said, man, I'm going to do it because it's the sunnah. And he brings out all those hadith. And they're right. Whoever gets married, he finished half of his deen, all of that. But he doesn't know this hadith I just told him. Hey, man, hey, girl. Anyone who leaves something for Allah, Allah will reward you and replace it with what is better. Don't destroy your relationship with your family for this girl or this boy. Didn't you hear? Blood is thicker than water, girl. You go ahead and marry that man without your mother and your father being involved in it. What's going to happen? When you get pregnant and you need your mother to help you and your sisters to help you and your aunties. What are you going to do when they cut you off? And it's the day of the Eid. No support for you. What are you going to do? What are you going to do when that cat divorces you? 
and you have one baby, two, three babies, what are you going to do? Men taraka shay'in lillahi awwaduhu ma huwa khayru minhu. And it's hard to comprehend this stuff when you're young. And that's why we have to have teachers who can understand these kids, understand kids, and teachers who have the heart and the nerve to tell you, yeah, I know you're 25, 30, you're still a kid, man. You're young. There's a fabricated hadith. It's not authentic, but it's true. It says that Shabab, being young is a shorba, it's a piece, it's a part of being crazy. Because when you're young, you just can't see beyond your nose. You don't use this head right here. You don't use this head right here, if you know what I mean. When you're young, you can't, it's just difficult. So you make decisions that will destroy your future. And we don't want you guys to be bums. All you're going to do is flip burgers in Burger King. So he's sitting there and he hears me say flip burgers in Burger King. He said, why are you using that example? Burger King is haram. <laughs> that ain't the point, man. You have the ability to be a doctor. You have the ability. Anyway, let me get to the point. I ain't got a lot of time. I'm getting ready. I'm tired. Have a nice room. I, I'm planning a day. I, oh, you're going to be on top of this, man. You're going to be ready for this. You're going to bring your A game. I'm going to take a nice shower because it was a nice shower. Shower was big, man. And they had a seat, a marble seat. And they had the thing in, over your head, just like that. Water come out here, one here, come here, one here. I was like, man, it's going to be wasting a lot of water. But hey, I'm on my vacation. I'm Mecca. I deserve this. I sat down. I was tired. Put the water on. That's what I'm thinking. But I got a call from the UK. It was my queen, my mama Sita, my little mama. She said, Big Papa, listen, we got a problem. I said, what's the matter, honey? She said, our baby, you know the one who never lies to you. You know the one who you love. You love the very earth that she walks on, your baby. She did kita wa kita wa kit. My head said, woo, woo, woo. I tell you no lie. Woo, 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 woo. You guys don't know about Charlie Brown. I watched Charlie Brown when I was, that's how Charlie Brown and them just talk. That's what it reminded me of. I couldn't see straight. I said, don't worry. I called her, my daughter. The imam was coming to the member in six minutes, five minutes. I'm supposed to be getting ready to translate. I call that sister on FaceTime. I catch her. Hey, what is this that I heard about this and that and what you did and this and that and this and that? And I just went off. I lost it. I lost it. Here I am in Mecca and you got me disoriented, discombobulated. I supposed to be, you girl, you girl, when I get back there, I'm just going to be firing a hole. I'm going to deal with you. I was going off. And then the imam came out. My high blood pressure was high. I could feel it in my head. I just did hijama in Medina for my high blood pressure. Wallahi, after I did the hijama, on the top of your head, like the Prophet did, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he made hajj. He did it. They did it here too. Did it on your head. After about 45 minutes in Medina, I had so much clarity. It felt like when people were talking to me, I could see subtitles coming out their mouth. <laughs> I am you guys laughing. I'm trying to tell you what the deal is. Not only that, but you know the bouncing ball that go on the words? I was seeing like subtitles. I was like, whoa, I ain't no Sufi, man. <laughs> but that's how good I felt. And we ordered the food and everything. A brother came out from Pakistan. We ordered, we came around, and he said, you can't eat here. You didn't buy it from here, this and that. And as he was talking, normally I would get upset with that. But I saw a man over his head. It was like, 
He ain't married. He's being oppressed. He got to send money back. The kafil is not giving us his money. So I'm like, I saw all of that, man. So I just broke him off with a dime. Bam. Here you go, man. Bam. He said, hi. And he went. And we ate. That's how I felt. But in Mecca, when my daughter, I called her, I went off. I spoke in a way I shouldn't have spoken, and I said what I shouldn't have said. Hung up the phone. I had to calm down, do my breathing exercises. I said, let me jump in the shower while the Adhan is going off. I got to get in the shower, man. I got in the shower, and I got off. The man started giving the khutbah. Wallahi, alladhi la ilaha illahu. He started talking about the importance of the family and how the father has to be a muslim and how the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam dealt with Ali and Fatima and how the husband has to be with the wife and the wife. Ah, man, I was blown away. Man, I was blown away. I was blown away. After that, I called my baby girl up. I said, you know what? I got to apologize. The way I dealt with you was not nice. It was selfish. It was for me. I'm talking to the parents here right now. I was going off for me. That's why I was dealing with you. I should have dealt with you in a better way. I should have dealt with you in a way where I leave part of my legacy, that I understand you, that I love you that you'll always measure every dude that comes in your life. Measure him up to me, measure him by me. How I dealt with you when I was angry. I didn't do that, I dropped the ball. I apologized to my girl, started crying, I was emotional. Because that was my biggest fitna in Mecca. Shaitan came to me through my daughter and she's in a, in, over here. I felt I lost my, my, I lost my umrah. I'm talking like that in Mecca. She was a fitna. And that's what Allah said in the Quran. That your wives and your children are fitness to you, so beware of them. Don't be a fitna to your peoples. How in the world do you see yourself as being a practicing person and you are fitna? Because you're getting married without their knowledge, you're rough and tough, you're on the sunnah and they're not, and you are anti-sociable and the way you're behaving. I'm sharing this with you, why? Because I'm not one of them corny imams, you know, sheikh glow in the dark, the mulvi sab flying around with the malaika. I don't believe in that stuff. We respect every imam and every sheikh. But come on, man, come on. That's the first story I wanna tell you guys. I'm flawed. But I could tell you that and look you straight in the eye because you're all flawed as well. Kullu bani adam khata'un. And we all make mistakes. But do we have the ability to fall back and say, I'm sorry? How much time we got? Do we have that ability? My daughter was a fitna for me, man. Threw my umrah out of the window. And from that point on, I felt I was always trying to pay catch up. I have to give more sadaqah. I have to do more classes. I have to do more of the Quran. I have to make more istighfar. I have to make more tawbah. But what I did was I used that as motivation because I clicked on. Shaitan thought he had me. He tried to get me. But I know that Allah Azawajal will forgive you, man. That's the first story I want to share with you. Second story I want to share with you that happened recently, and in it for me was big time, big time lesson. When I got there, I was tired, man. I was already tired before getting there. But I was suffering from insomnia. I wasn't sleeping. And that only happens to me in Saudi Arabia, only. It doesn't happen all the time, but it happens. I go to the Middle East, Bahrain, Qatar, Abu Dhabi, Dubai, Kuwait, never happens to me, never. Only in Saudi Arabia, sometimes, sometimes. And it happened on this trip. I was tired. So we had to take them to the Baqir. That's the graveyard where the companions are buried and many of the Muslims are buried. So we're gonna go after Fajr. After they bury the whoever died, we take our group and move them over there far away from the Popo. Because you can't give talks there. You got to go away from the popo, man. They don't want you doing that. 
And if the popo come and say you can't do that, we get up because we obey the lead in El Islam. So I didn't want to go because I was tired. We all got there. We got at the masjid early. You know, the adhan, we had two rakat. Our leader of the group said, hey, instead of praying here, let's go all the way over by that door where the prophet's grave is, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the extinction. Let's go over there, and this way we'll be close to the baqir. We don't have to run. We have some older brothers. They won't be able to keep up if we prayed anywhere else. I didn't want to move from where we were. I was tired, man. I was tired. Insomnia, all of this stuff in my head. I'm tired. I said, all right, man. I'm with the jama'ah. We went. We prayed. We got up. We walked to the baqir. Listen to this. There were three janazas, three bodies. We saw them whisking by. When we got there, the brothers went inside where the bodies are being buried. I just stayed on the path where you walk, tired. Actually, after Fajr, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, I was hoping that it wouldn't be a janaza. I was saying, oh, if there's no janaza, I'll be there. Yeah, I just go back, and that's it. Yeah, selfish, but I was tired. I was hoping, no janazah, please. And then they, they make the announcement, Salat ana amwat, ya rahamakum Allah. <laughs> Swimming with the sharks, man. Anyway, I went in Khwani, I sat in the pathway. I didn't get where they were burying, but I started hearing a man, a voice going, mm, 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 mm. not well in a siyaha, haram. The Prophet says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Thalatha min umur al jahiliya, len, len al abadiya, len tatrukuha ummati abada, wa dhakra minha, an yaha ala al mait, wal fakhr bil aba, wa ta'an fil ansab. Three things that they did in jahiliya scream and shout over the dead. Rip open their clothes. The women be slapping each other in Jahiliya. She cut her hair off, bald head, hollering, screaming. In Al Islam, we don't have that edip. They don't have iman. They don't believe in the qadr, so you act crazy. The other thing is being proud of who you are, bragging about where you come from, and being talking bad about what other people. Racism, like we have. We have that. Anyway, anyway, very quickly, I finished this story. And then there's Ibra. I heard that. And I kept hearing it. I kept hearing it. It pulled me to him. I got up and I went, man. And I found myself behind a man who had a nice, clean white thobe on. He had his gutra on. And I could smell expensive oud from him. And he was there. And they were throwing more. The dirt was full, but they were, they was filling up. And the, the, the turab, the dust was coming up. The ghurab. The ghubar, the ghubar, the ghubar was coming up. And he was crying, crying, like, mm -hmm. and then when they finished, that man fell down on the dirt. Not in a crazy way. Fell down in the dirt with his white thobe in it. When I saw that, I thought about my little baby, Shaybatul Hamd. Little kid is fragile, like all of us, die any moment, choke on a bone, choke on a piece of bread, fall down the stairs, break your neck, break your head, whatever. And I started crying, man. I started crying. And it made me realize I cannot keep going. And me and my son in London, I'm upset with him. Because if he checked out, I'll be sad. I got to make restorations and rectify and be the bigger guy. I had a hole in my sock that day. I had a hole in my sock the day before, and I put the same socks on that morning. So when we finished that, when we finished that, I went and I started talking to the brothers about those ayats of death and everything. And then I looked at my sock, and I said, you see this hole in my sock right here? This hole doesn't mean anything in comparison to the reality of what happened in that grave. And the sun was coming up. Now you can see everything. It gave me vision, the reality of the life. The reality of the life is not that I wore one of my nice robes today and that you wore yours. And that we, the reality of, we're going to check out of this joint. We're going to check out. 
We're going to get checked out. Get yourselves together, inshallah. Now you're living at a time that is a nirma, being young. Take advantage of it by planting seeds. Take advantage of five before five and all the stuff like that. The reality is you are going to check out. And the people in this room right now, somebody here is going to be the first one to die from amongst us. Allah know who he is. Somebody dying before everybody else in this room. And then the second and the third, and Allah knows all of those details. Everybody sat here and you breathe since I've been sitting here, since you've been, Allah knows everyone you took in and out, every blink of the eye, everybody's issues. Make toba, make toba, and stop wasting time. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa nasallallaha ta'ala tawfiq wa sadaad. Zakumla khair, may Allah reward our Sheikh, Sheikh Abu Usama, for the beneficial talk. Inshallah, we're going to take a short break for Salat al Maghrib. After Salat al Maghrib, we're going to continue with our panel discussion entitled Challenges of the West, where we will have, inshallah, some of uh, these mashayikh that we've spent some time with over the last couple of hours. Sheikh Abu Taymiyyah, Ustad Mustafa Abu Rayyan, Sheikh Abu Usama, and Sheikh Muhammad Ali discussing some of the important issues that we face in the West. So, inshallah, we will continue after Salat al Maghrib. Jazakumullah khair.